Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Sigmund Freud's book, The Ego and the Id. Now, this is one that has been really useful for my own research, but this is also a book that I got a request to do a video on. So as a reminder, or in case you uh, did not know this, if there is a particular text that you want me to do a video on, you can send me a request either in the comments, either in the comments or through email. I can't, I don't guarantee that I will make a video about it, but I will attempt to accommodate as many requests as I can. So the ego and the id, this is a kind of a, almost a summary book in a way, um, because Basically, Freud is pulling together things that he had written about in other places or that other psychoanalysts had written about in other places, and he's laying out a three-part schema of the mind, the conscious, the unconscious, and the pre-conscious mind. Um, Freud is laying out a particular way in which he thinks that they work uh, at this point in 1933. 1923, I think. Um, 1923, according to the back, I thought it was 1933. Anyway, um, in the 20s or 30s, uh, so Freud has this three-part schema that he develops for how the mind works. And those three parts are the ego, the id and the superego. And these are each related. The id and the superego are really part of, more part of the unconscious mind, whereas the ego sort of straddles the line because it's connected to the unconscious mind, particularly in terms of how it interacts with the id and the superego, but it's also the conscious mind is really centered in the ego and the ego connects to the outside world. It, it, it connects to and processes the stimuli of the outside world, and it helps us really make decisions about how to engage with things outside of ourselves. So, one of the things that Freud talks about in this book is that initially the existence of the unconscious as such was something that psychoanalysts had to assume because the entire sort of premise of the discipline and the, the talking cure that Freud comes up with in the 1880s and all of the stuff that he, all of the, the knowledge that accumulates among psychoanalysts by the 1920s really sort of tells them that we are not always conscious of why we make particular decisions. What we, we, don't, we are not in full control over the things that we intend to do. And so this is where the whole idea of the unconscious comes in. And then Freud says that through the actual process of analysis, of psychoanalysis, they accumulate evidence for the existence of the unconscious mind, but Freud says that unconscious is divided into multiple pieces. So the first bit that he introduces is the ego. And it's a, the ego is a somewhat flexible term in Freudian psychoanalysis um, because it can sometimes stand for just the individual coherent picture of themselves, but it can also be a part of the mental faculties that are engaged with trying to limit what the the id wants to do and trying to sort of negotiate with the superego. Uh, so what he says here, we have formed the idea that in each individual there's a coherent organization of mental processes, and we call this his ego. It is to this ego that consciousness is attached. The ego controls the approaches to motility, that is, the discharge of excitations into the external world. It is the mental agency which supervises all its own constituent processes and which goes to sleep at night, though even then it exercises the censorship on dreams. 
From this ego proceed the re repressions, too, by means of which it sought to exclude certain trends in the mind, not merely from consciousness, but also from other forms of effectiveness and activity. So, what does he mean by this? Well, essentially, the ego is the conscious identity, basically. The, thing, the person that we think that we are is the ego. But the ego is more than this as well, because the ego fundamentally is the reality principle in contrast to the id, which is aligned with the pleasure principle. Now, this, is, this really draws on Freud's previous book, The Pleasure Principle, where he lays out the idea of the pleasure principle, the reality principle, and the death instinct, or the death drive, as it's sometimes translated. Basically, short version, the pleasure principle is whatever I want to do to bring myself immediate gratification and avoid unpleasure, in Freud's term, uh, that's what I do. So, if I want to eat all the food, have sex with people, commit violence, whatever it is, if that's going to gratify my impulses, my drives, then I do that. That is pleasure principle. So that's really what the id is aligned with. Um, so what he says here about the id. It's easy to see that the ego is that part of the id which has been modified by the direct influence of the external world through the medium of percept, uh, perception consciousness. In a sense, it is an extension of the surface differentiation. Moreover, the ego seeks to bring the influence of the external world to bear upon the id and its tendencies and endeavors to substitute the reality principle for the pleasure principle which reigns unrestricted in the id. For the ego, perception plays the part which in the id falls to instinct. The ego represents what we may call reason and common sense in contrast to the id which contains the passions. So, essentially, the ego, so the id is the part of you that wants to do whatever is, you do whatever you sort of on an instinctual, visceral level thinks is going to bring you pleasure. The example I often use is the id is the part of you that wants to eat the entire cake. The ego is the part of you that says, okay, but if you eat the entire cake, you're going to be sick later. And that's the reality principle. The reality principle basically is if you give in and just gratify your desires continually, then that will create unpleasure in the future. Or uh, there will be some sort of consequences for this. If you go out and commit acts of violence because you enjoy doing it, you will go to jail. And so the reality principle tells you the amount of uh, enjoyment you would get from committing that violence is less than the amount of unpleasure or unenjoyment you would get from going to jail. So, this is the it, the relationship between the id and the ego. The, the id wants to go out and do all the stuff. It wants to enjoy, it wants to consume, it wants to do these instinctual things, and the ego has to restrain it. The ego has to say, no, we can't do these things. We can't eat all the food, we can't have sex with whoever we want, we can't commit acts of violence, because there will be negative consequences. And one of the things Freud does talk about in this book is that the ego will often try and present alternatives to the thing that the id doesn't get. Uh, so the ego will try and sort of reconfigure itself or parts of itself in order to make up for lost love objects, as Freud puts it in here, um, to, to basically make up for the things that the id doesn't get to do in order to allow the ego to control the id, in order to allow the, the reality principle to be imposed on the pleasure principle as a form of repression. And that's another big concept in here, is the idea of repression. That is, preventing particular instincts or impulses or drives or whatever it is from dominating the subject and controlling what they do. Uh, as as 
people later on, like I think it's Herbert Marcuse, comes up with the idea of surplus repression. Um, so as psychoanalysts later note, there are different approaches to repression or different forms of repression, some of which are more basic, some of which are more in excess of others. So, but that's basically the relationship between the ego and the id. The id is, I want to go do things. The ego is, we can't because bad stuff will happen. So we need to repress that desire. I'll give you an alternative to fulfilling that desire, et cetera, et cetera. But the third element of this triad is the superego. Um, the superego, also uh, called the ego ideal in this book. That Those terms are often used interchangeably, though later on I think superego simply becomes the, the particular term. The superego is essentially an internalized voice of authority, a conscience, but I would say kind of a conscience on steroids. Um, so what essentially happened? So, okay, I'll read you this section. Um, Actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to read you this section and then I'll come back to this. Not that you know which pages I'm on, but uh, so the superego Freud characterizes as self-judgment, which declares that the ego falls short of its ideal. Um, and he also says that social feelings rest on identifications with other people on the basis of having the same ego ideal. So the, e the superego is the part of the unconscious that judges, not just what we do, but what we want to do. So the sense of guilt for, like uh, Jimmy Carter, right? And that famous thing where he was like, he like came out and confessed that he had lust, he had lusted in his heart after other women or something like this. That's super ego. That's, it's not, I, Jimmy Carter, have had adulterous affairs. It's, I wanted to have adulterous affairs. And so I am penalized not for my actions, which would be what the reality principle is concerned with, but for my desires, for what I want to do. That's really what superego is about. And superego is kind of rooted in internalized versions of external authority figures the father being the primary one in Freudian psychoanalysis. Uh, so for Freud, this would mean generally the literal father, like your actual male parent. For Lacan, who comes along and builds on Freud's work, this might mean both the actual literal physical father, but also the capital F father. That is the, the other, the big other, the figure of sort of ultimate authority and ultimate access to enjoyment. And we can see that the roots of that idea in Freud's description of the superego here. Um, but for Freud especially, uh, and actually equally I'd say for Lacan, for, for psychoanalysts, I'll put it that way, um, it's not just the father either the literal father or the figurative father that sets the template for the superego. This can also be religious leaders. This can be teachers. Any form of authority that tries to limit and control and instill a sense of morality and especially a sense of guilt in the subject can contribute to shaping the superego. So the other thing that Freud says about the superego here, and this sort of takes us through the actions of the superego, the way that it's connected to the Oedipus complex, which was still very central to Freud's thought in the 20s and 30s, and then how the, how the strength of the superego develops. So he says, the superego is, however, not simply a residue of the earliest object choices of the id. It also represents an energetic reaction formation against those choices. 
Its relation to the ego is not exhausted by the precept, you ought to be like this, like your father. It also comprises the prohibition, you may not be like this, like your father. That is, you may not do all that he does. Some things are his prerogative. That's an interesting point, because that's actually one of the big things that Lacan will later pick up on and really develop in his psychoanalytic practice. Um, this idea that the big other is imagined to be the entity entitled to full enjoyment that is denied to the subject. Um, this double aspect of the ego ideal derives from the fact that the ego ideal has the task of repressing the Oedipus complex. Indeed, it is to that revolutionary event that it owes its existence. Clearly, the repression of the Oedipus complex was no easy task. The child's parents, and especially his father, were perceived as the obstacle to a realization of his Oedipus wishes, so his infantile ego fortified itself for the carrying out of the repression by erecting this same obstacle within itself. It borrowed strength to, do, strength to do this, so to speak, from the father, and this loan was an extraordinarily momentous act. The superego retains the character of the father while the more powerful the Oedipus complex was and the more rapidly it succumbed to repression, under the influence of authority, religious teaching, schooling, and reading, the stricter will be the domination of the superego over the ego later on, in the form of conscience or perhaps of an unconscious sense of guilt. So basically, the superego develops as the ego attempts to repress the Oedipus complex. That is, as it attempts to prevent the drive in Freudian psychoanalysis to usurp the position of the father by uh, having sex with the mother, more or less. It's not necessarily quite as blunt as that, but that's essentially the gist of it. So the superego develops as the ego says, no, you can't do these things. And the superego then takes on the role of that repressive force. And in order to do that, it models itself on these external authorities. And so one of the things that's really striking to me about the superego, the idea of the superego, is that it kind of doesn't matter how actually repressive the father was. What matters is how repressive the figure of the father that develops in the superego is. So it's not like I had a very loose, uh, happy-go-lucky, laissez-faire father. I have so, I, and then I therefore have a mild superego. It's I perceived my father on some level as being a very strict disciplinarian, and therefore I have a, a, a strict superego. So this is the way that this works. So this is the three-part schema, the ego, the id, and the superego. Um, again, the ego is the negotiator between external reality and the internal processes, the unconscious processes of the id and the superego, the id is driven by the pleasure principle and the desire to just enjoy, 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 enjoy in the immediate. And then the superego is, here is why you are terrible and worthless and should feel shitty about yourself.